Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Well, uh, so far we have discussed some of the basic concepts and uh, in the last lecture, I had uh, given a brief uh, discussion on the meaning of culture and then cultural ecology and uh, cultural ecological theory and uh, in this lecture, we will be looking at uh, what human ecology is. It's, uh, basic concepts, meanings and the interrelationship between different kinds of uh, resources in this uh, planet system and uh, how it is one of uh, the component in a sense is affecting the other species. So, in some way uh, the humans, uh, if you take as an entity, uh, whatever we does often leave an imprint or it does have uh, some kind of implications on the uh, environment. This is something uh, which uh, in a sense the human ecology tries to look at. Now, to begin with, uh, Let us try to uh, familiarize ourselves with what human ecology is. Uh, human ecology in essence is a kind of approach uh, in order to look at or study human behavior and uh, this can perhaps be uh, divided into two and uh, the first part looks at uh, how humans should be studied living systems operating in a complex environment. Now, if you look at in the slides, you would see operating in complex environments. Why is human uh, seen to be or known to be operating in the complex environment? is because it is different from the plants and animals and we all know human itself in itself is unpredictable for the simple reason that human is guided by different emotions, different desires, different needs. Therefore, the way human operate in this uh, environment is quite uh, complex and therefore, human ecologists uh, tends to deal with this and art uh, how the way how humans operate uh, or tries to uh, make uh, an in depth study into this. And in a sense, human science also can be divided into uh, several social science disciplines. If you look at uh, in the social sciences, uh, it can be divided into humanistic as well as the human uh, biological disciplines. Now, within this, ecologists attempt to understand how this diverse part of uh, the system operate together in order to produce uh, some kind of behavior and this behavior is something which is being learned uh, as a part of uh, socialization. It is not something 
which is pre-given, but it is something which is being learned not just uh, in the environment, but also beginning from the family system. Therefore, uh, it is important to look at this diverse part of system, which in a way environment also affects or have uh, and uh, implications on human behavior. Now, in a sense, uh, in a traditional sense, human, human science disciplines uh, take or separate people apart, while the human ecologist uh, posits or attempts to put us back together. Now, that is some of the basic difference between a human science and a human ecologist. Now, partly human science tends to uh, separate or segregate depending on uh, our needs or at the same time based on uh, our expertise, skills, so on and so forth. Whereas, human ecology tends to put human together because it tends to situate human in relationship with the ecosystem or maybe in terms of our relationship with the biodiversity for instance. And uh, having said that, uh, secondly human ecology also deals with uh, how in this uh, similar setting or if not through this ecology and evolutionary processes, human is also part of the other species. So, in a sense, uh, if I may say so, uh, human ecology tends to posit if not follow this approach of uh, biocentric. By biocentric, I mean to say that human is also part of the ecology if not part of the whole ecosystem. Now, it is also interesting to see that human is not something uh, which has a dominance over other species, but rather they are part and parcel of the whole ecosystem. Now, that is how uh, it is a part of the biocentric approach to the ecosystem. And uh, secondly, if we go by the basic definitions of what human ecology is, uh, where I <coughs> give a, a conventional definitions, if you look at the conventional definitions of what human ecology is, it uh, is about the study of uh, how humans interacts with their environments or in a sense uh, the kind of distributions and abundance of humans, the, uh, how uh, human in a sense uh, populate and also it tends to you know uh, distribute itself based on their needs. Now, over here you can bring in the um, idea of this carrying capacity. For instance, uh, a human population will definitely tries to inhabit a geographical area, wherein uh, it in a sense provide uh, enough resources for the needs of those population. Now, partly if you look at the history of uh, the evolution of society or how the stages of societies move on. Uh, if you look back at the hunting and gathering society, they were in a sense being uh, distributed and they were populated depending on the uh, carrying capacity of the resources or maybe the requirement of animals in order to satisfy their basic needs. Now, 
society moves on from a more complex, simple to complex, depending on how their basic requirements and needs tends to, in essence, multiply. Now, that itself also shows the kind of behavioral changes in relations to uh, the environment we are into it. Now, secondly, if you look at uh, the basic definitions, uh, human ecology in essence uh, deals with the relations, the relationship between humans and their environment. This is the basic or the rudimentary principles of human ecology, what it tries to espouse and tries to make sense of uh, the relationship can be formed in many ways. Uh, as I explained, uh, uh, relationship can be based on fulfilling the basic needs. It can be based on rather uh, fulfilling much more than what you actually required. Now, this is something which we need to look at how the kind of relationship. It relationship can be complex as a uh, I had explained uh, in the context of human because it is considered to be much more complex uh, compared to other uh, relationship which is being shared by the other species. Now, therefore, if we use this term human ecology, it actually tries to express a broad aspirations to understand human behavior. Now, what is this broad aspiration? It tends to, you know, like uh, there are different uh, embedded meanings within this. How these aspirations are being exp uh, expressed? For instance, uh, in a modern capitalist society, these uh, aspirations could be more in terms of accumulation of wealth, because capitalist society is again being influenced or being guided by the market economy or the market forces. It is nothing but a profit driven uh, ideas. Now, if one is being driven by these uh, profit driven ideas, obviously the kind of behavior or the relationship it share with environment will definitely be different. Now, for instance, uh, it, those who practice opposite or subscribes to the idea of uh, a capitalist economy, which is of course, uh, beginning from the Western society and uh, even in the global south today, uh, we are in essence being affected as a process of this globalization, modernization process and the market forces, uh, sort of aspirations keep changing and many of these aspirations are actually being defined and guided by these forces that is profit driven desire. Now, we tend to see the environment if not the resources as something which will in essence fulfill our needs or rather grids. Now, that sort of ideas tends to develop that aspirations or ideas within us to see or posit the resources as something uh, from a very utilitarian perspective. The economic value of resources or the external value rather, we tend to overlook the intrinsic value of those resources, <coughs> the kind of relationship which normally was being shared in the past generations. Now, we tend to engage in trying to commodify or commodifications of these resources as if we are, we tend to follow this idea of uh, how the resources cannot be 
they are in, inexhaustible. Now, for instance, uh, for quite some time water is seen to be seen to be uh, something which is uh, out of the context of this resource, but today water is seen to be given more importance and it is part of the resources and which in a way can be uh, depleted. Now, this sense of urgency or uh, realization in a sense has come up because there has been an extensive commodifications of even these water resources. Now, uh, we can cite certain examples and then the list can go on how many of these the corporate companies now for instance like the coke company for instance uh, producing this coca cola and pepsi for instance they have been excessively exploiting or uh, using these fresh drinking water bodies in order to satisfy their sort of market needs. Now, and we also uh, tends to you know like come across different kind of uh, intertrans boundary water disputes between states within India for instance and across different countries and nations. Now, because we in a sense felt the sort of importance of this water resource as which which was considered to be you know like freely given to us as if uh, it cannot in a sense be exhaustible. Now, these are partly something which we can try to perhaps include or trying to uh, sort of give a critique questions debate about the human relationship with their environment across uh, different stages and then primarily in the present context. And uh, why is this uh, relationship between human and environment is in a sense uh, given so much importance today and, and why is the need to locate and situate uh, this relationship. And uh, in, the, in the upcoming lectures, we will try to address and look at how uh, society maintained or connected with nature or environment uh, in the past. So, this is something which we would be looking at. Now, looking at the background of how this uh, human ecology study uh, in essence uh, emerges why, why, why what is the basic need of uh, even talking about human ecology or positioning human ecology uh, in the academic domain. Now, partly uh, if you look at uh, history, human usually engage in different kinds of activities and that have in a sense uh, directly or indirectly affected or so to say damage the environment and some of these implications are seen to be dangerous and uh, permanent in a sense. So, because even there, there are resources which can be uh, renewable and non-renewable, because when we engage in trying to uh, damage the non-renewable resources, it does leave a permanent scar in uh, the environment. And as a result of this, uh, there, there is sort of uh, a pose which is being uh, threat, a threat which is being posed to the environment. Uh, because uh, if you look at the post industrial society and uh, with the beginning of colonialism, uh, many countries were being colonized and uh, India is one of them, where the Britishes were in essence uh, colonizing more than 200 years. Now, the amount or the 
kind of uh, natures which was being exploited and damaged during this period that is in the post the industrial and post industrial period and the colonial period the magnitude of how the environment is being uh, damaged or resource were depleted multiplies uh, much more than anything else and uh, why is this damage on the environment so much felt and so much high. Perhaps uh, one reason could be the increase in the size of population. Now, uh, Malthus might have a different, uh, if you go by the Malthusian theory of these populations, it tends to see the increasing population size as something which also is posing a threat to the environment, because he tends to see in terms of uh, the supply and demand or maybe if population increases and definitely it is going to have uh, an impact on the environment that is in uh, exploiting of much more resources. Therefore, if we go by the Malthusian theory, uh, increase in size of populations is perhaps uh, one of uh, the factors of how this the natural system is being affected or reduced or the carrying capacity is being under threat. Now, perhaps uh, Malthus in a sense also contribute uh, to you know uh, influencing some of the uh, earlier thinkers who tends to come up with this idea of this human ecology or the human ecologist rather. Now, when we talk about this increasing human population for instance, if you take the examples of the present day for instance, the process of this urbanization, the urbanization has in a sense uh, tends to uh, exploit it, the resources or maybe there is much more demand of land, a space which is required for the human settlement. Now, by, by and by as a result of this uh, modernization process, people tends to shift the more and more from the rural to the urban spaces and uh, those populations in the urban spaces again is dependent on the hinterland if not the rural areas for the supply of food. Now, that rural urban continuum is in a sense uh, have started uh, maybe prior to the colonial period and then it is much more strengthened. Now, why is this urbanization seen as a problem? Now, for instance, uh, as population increases crowding and then many of the cities especially in the south or maybe in India are unplanned and there is an irresponsible uh, sort of dumping of waste items and as a result of this it tends to you know uh, pollute uh, the river water bodies and uh, as a result of this it not only pose a threat to the land as such, but also to the water resources. These are some uh, very basic things uh, which in a sense we can explain in this context. There are a lot more examples, but uh, this will suffice for us to make sense of how the population increases uh, and also it resulted to uh, reduce the natural ecosystem. Now, secondly, uh, why are these uh, natural systems 
in a sense or the ecosystems uh, under threat, because they are no longer able to kind of uh, process and read the biosphere of waste which accumulate in our pol pollutants. Now, even pollutants can be uh, uh, broadly divided into different it can be uh, air, water and uh, mostly uh, as a result of the industrial waste. Now, I uh, will show you some of the pictures in the later let slides, uh, where how uh, as a result of the uh, industrialization process and uh, uh, there is a lot of toxic items being dumped on the river and then the river in a sense becomes unfit for human consumption. Now, what, why is this pollutants in a sense being seen to be a threat to the natural ecosystem is because they are a substance which are added to the environment, particularly these are because of the results of human activities and uh, the human activities can be right. Now, uh, dumping of waste in a sense is one of them and which in a, in a sense indirectly uh, lead to uh, directly lead to the un undesirable effect for all living things and uh, ultimately on the humans themselves, which, which in a sense is hardly being realized. Now, uh, human in a sense uh, by engaging all this kind of activity involved in adding pollutants of all sorts uh, to the biosphere that is land, water and air. Now, these uh, activities which human in a sense engage in a very irresponsible manner has a far reaching impact on the biosphere. Now, for instance, the depletion of uh, this the ozone laser which in a sense is also uh, something which is very much debated and discussed. Now, what are these factors, what are the different factors which in a sense uh, affect the human population growth. Now, uh, there were times where human populations were not really a problem or a threat, rather there was uh, a static growth. Now, why is uh, the population of human uh, multiplied and what are the factors responsible for that? First and foremost could be the agriculture revolution and as a result of agriculture revolutions, the food productions in a sense multiply and as a result of this, uh, it also in a sense through the use of different kinds of uh, technologies human tends to uh, produce much more food and uh, there was a surplus of food rather. Now, the second thing is there is an awareness or an increasing uh, knowledge of ideas and how for instance malaria at one point of time uh, was a threat to mankind and it also resulted to uh, the death of uh, many people. Now, for instance, now since that uh, very uh, diseases which is being caused by uh, that called malaria, uh, as a result of different uh, inventions and uh, the development of medical sciences it tends to uh, develop some kind of treatment and so is different other diseases uh, because this the development of these medical sciences enhances or rather lead to the uh, 
cutting down of the mortality rate of humankind and therefore, that, that it could be one factor which led to the growth of populations and, and obviously, the healthcare facilities is much more higher compared to the, those say 10 years or 50 years before and uh, accessibility to like the healthcare uh, centers like hospital dispensaries so and so forth is much more uh, rather available in close proximity uh, than maybe 10 years 20 years before because people tends to travel you know like kilometers after kilometers or maybe uh, they do not have accessibility to these health facilities and it resulted to the death of uh, many. Now, what is this uh, the, the advances in medicines and technology not just only simply uh, cut down the mortality rate, but rather also the longevity of human life in a sense is being extended. Uh, the lifespan usually uh, has in a sense increased. Now, maybe 70 years or more than 70 in a sense is an expected lifespan of a human life. Now, as a result of these uh, emerging uh, uh, facilities, the development of uh, medical science, technology, knowledge and uh, the development of this agriculture revolution. All this in essence have catered to the decrease in death rate and also led to the uh, longer lifespan and increasing birth rate in some areas. Increasing birth rate in a sense uh, if you look around. Uh, for instance, the IVF, even the couples who lose the hope of you know like conceiving a child through the use of uh, the medical health can in a sense uh, conceive. So, this sort of uh, facilities were unknown to people like maybe a few decades back. Now, as a result of this, there has been an increasing fertility rates and uh, mostly in the in the underdeveloped nations. Now, because the underdeveloped nations uh, primarily I mentioned this because uh, there is sort of there is no checks and balances and uh, the kind of health facilities which is which has been discussed in the like for example, countries like India maybe there is an imbalance still because we do not have adequate number of these maybe doctors or medical centers which in a sense can you know like uh, cater to the uh, needs of the people. Now, and also there is no sort of population controlled and uh, in a sense uh, there is an imbalance in the terms of uh, the existing populations and the kind of facilities which is normally being provided by not only the government, but also <coughs> the resources, the natural resources. Now, what have all this uh, led to like the increasing uh, I mean the rate of population growth. Now, in essence, uh, there are two types of resources which I had uh, mentioned one is the renewable resources and the second is the non renewable resources. What is this renewable resources which can perhaps be replaced now for, in, for, for example, the food supply, the solar energy, air, water, soil living things all these are in a sense renewable. Whereas, they are non renewable resources which cannot be replaced in one's lifetime that for example, the fossil fuels. Now, for instance, uh, on the on this picture you could actually see uh, how 
uh, there has been uh, you know like a changes in terms of not just uh, the use of motor vehicles or the changes which in a sense uh, resulted to the depletion of resources and all these are in a sense uh, as a result of the human uh, population growth and the environment. Now, again uh, these are partly something which is uh, a result of the supply and demand of the market. How people are extensively engaged in uh, extraction of timbers from the forest that itself in a sense lead to the deforestation or the amount of deforestation is much more at a faster and higher speed compared to the past because there is much more of a demand in the market for woods maybe for, for furniture and or maybe as we talk about in the people like uh, populating in the, the urban spaces in cities because population grows and not just uh, extraction but we also tends to uh, be in much more demand of uh, spaces for settlement and also resulted in consuming more resources and also we produce more waste because the more human population the more human waste is. And if we look around in many of our cities the kind of waste management or waste treatment is uh, something which we are very much uh, lacking behind. And uh, if you go to any uh, city the manner in which the municipality corporations the way they functions. It, it is as if uh, something not really adequate and then they are not able to in a sense you know uh, engaging in uh, cleaning up all these waste items. Perhaps the strength and forces is not really uh, much after the demand because there is a lot of population and then the waste items multiplies and increases. Now, in this picture uh, you can also look at how this introduction of railway in a sense also contribute to the depletion of resources. Now, going back to the colonial period, why was this railways uh, being introduced uh, in every nook and corner of the country in India? is simply because it is being used for uh, sort of transporting different kinds of resources and these resources in a way is raw material which is to be supplied to the industry. Now, as a result of this the kind of resources which are being exploited is uh, enormous and it has led to a uh, higher scale and speed compared to uh, before this uh, introduction of railways and uh, other facilities were av available. Now, for instance, uh, the paper industry for, for, for example, is in demand of much more of uh, resources like wood. Now, we, are, we have increasingly realized that uh, you know uh, we should you know like uh, use less paper and then but but to in in practical these are something which is still yet to be uh, implicated because uh, we tend to use uh, a lot of uh, we, we don't really establish or being aware of the kind of interconnections which we in a sense uh, have an implications on the environment rather. So, this is something which we need to not just only discuss in academia, but also uh, 
the, this environmental awareness needs to be uh, developed even in the right from the high schools. And uh, in the last few years, the environment component is being taught in high school and uh, this increasing awareness will definitely have an implications in terms of the relationship between uh, the human and the environment. So, as a result of this, we need to in a sense try to locate historically how we humans have started trying to, try, uh, trying to uh, extract if not exploit the resources more abundantly and then what are the factors responsible for it. So, unless we know the factors responsible for it, we cannot afford to come up with some kind of uh, a solution or rather an alternative approach to this. Let us uh, now try to look at how urbanization is in a sense affecting and disrupting the ecosystem. ecosystem. Now, as we all know uh, in the so, so called uh, traditional society, people are engaging in much more uh, farming practices in rural areas and today there is a shift of these farming practices which was more abundantly practiced in rural areas to cities. These are something which are the result of urbanization and mostly also because of the increase in industrialization and uh, many of these industries are being uh, centered uh, in close proximity or within the city. Now, that sort of you know like uh, uh, connectivity uh, tends to help in terms of supplying the raw materials in a much more faster pace. Now, as a result of this it has led to the destruction of this farmland and deforestation. And this uh, when we talk about this farmland we are talking about in the rural context. Now, this destruction of this farmland and deforestation have resulted in the decrease of uh, not just the amount of spaces uh, for other species but also in terms of the loss of habitats. Now, for instance, uh, since we populate and then move towards the cities, uh, we, we tend to you know like uh, pose a threat to the spaces uh, and uh, there is an increasing loss of the habitats. And also, we have this uh, witness the in decrease in the biodiversity. Now, when we talk about biodiversity, it includes uh, not just the land, but also the water bodies. Like for instance, some of the floods, uh, which we have encountered and witnessed in, in, the, in the past few years, uh, like for instance, the flood in Chennai. If you give uh, looked at uh, the kind of uh, study which are being done, some of the possible factors was an unplanned uh, way of human settlement, and also uh, by you know like developing those wetland areas uh, into uh, human settlement. Now, perhaps maybe there was uh, a least concern and less awareness about the importance of these wetland areas. And uh, you could actually see the water flowing in the heart of the city. These are in a sense uh, to be considered as a human or man made disaster, which, which, which in a sense we are alone responsible and uh, these floods could have been avoided if uh, there has been a mechanism or a kind of planned uh, 
which, which could have been easily averted. Now, there could be certain other factors, but uh, this is one uh, basic and uh, examples which we have uh, generally encounter and, and witness in the context of this urbanization and this development of the cities uh, exponentially have in a sense resulted in terms of you know like the way this uh, relationship between human and biodiversity or the impact on biodiversity is pretty much higher in compared to the uh, past few decades. Now, all this in a sense has led to the disruption of the ecosystem by not just introducing new species to an area uh, known or an, uh, uh, without uh, not known to the predator. Now, we in a sense uh, human becomes sort of uh, a predator rather than the protector. Now, uh, that sort of unmindful activities which we usually engage uh, tends to have uh, a threat and it disrupt the whole ecosystem. Now, continue to this, this the increasing number of this industry and the establishment of agriculture mostly uh, concentrated in the near the cities has in a way led to a terrible situation that human life uh, is seems to be posing a threat and uh, ecologically it has uh, sort of uh, to be seen as something we have reached a uh, mark of a point of uh, danger. Now, as a result of this increasing high level of industry and the agriculture which is concentrated uh, mostly on human economic activities, uh, have not just only uh, posed a threat to the ecology. Uh, for instance, the pollution of environment that is water pollution, air pollution and land pollution. Now, if you look at uh, the agriculture concentration and human economic activities. Now, these human economic activities also as I explained, mostly uh, the agriculture which was practiced in the past is to do with the subsistence, subsistence farm but the agriculture practices today is more of uh, the cash crop farming and uh, as a result of this in order or to have uh, an enormous or high amount of production people tends to uh, use uh, certain kind of maybe fertilizers chemicals so on and so forth and as a result of this ecologically speaking it has posed a lot of threat. Now, and which eventually has led to the pollution of the environment and in return these have uh, a far reaching impact on the human health. Now, therefore, a new branch of ecological science begins to develop with, uh, and that is human ecology that is because there are different uh, brands of uh, ecological science and within this human ecology is one of them. Now, by saying so we can in a sense say that human ecology is a discipline within uh, the academia that deals with the association between humans and their natural environment. The, it, is, it is not just uh, an association between humans and humans or maybe uh, between humans and animals, but the whole natural environment that is the ecosystem. 
Therefore, the kind of relationship which we shared with uh, uh, the natural environment, the human share with the environment is important and, uh, and this perhaps is one of the main pursuit of human ecology. And uh, now further uh, explaining about what human ecology aspire and then the uh, endeavors to look at. It uh, also uh, attempts to investigate how individuals and maybe individual societies uh, tends to sort of uh, uh, form a relationship with their environment. That is, uh, it, it can be in terms of the economic activity, it can be in terms of the socioculture, socioculture and religious practices and it, it can be varied. Now, definitely economic activity is perhaps the starting point and one should also tends to look beyond this. It, it is not just the economic production which defined the human relationship, uh, the environment per se, but also uh, different other parameters which into which we should have to situate the human environment discourse. Now, in the human ecology, it also uh, attempts to integrate knowledge from old uh, disciplines and the human experience and uh, also through these uh, experiences it uh, tries to uh, improve the human uh, relationship between uh, uh, in, 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 in social and the natural uh, communities. Now, because this by trying to look at the experiences, we tends to you know like come up with uh, a different suggestions and approach all together. So, that uh, it, it, it tends to uh, sort of form an alternative approach or a viable options. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, if we give an example of the traditional ecological knowledge of uh, a particular uh, community, say uh, an indigenous community. Now, through their experience over the past generations, we tend to document and locate how influential and how beneficial these uh, knowledge systems of those indigenous peoples. And perhaps by integrating this indigenous knowledge with the scientific knowledge, we can form uh, an alternative approach or find a way out to solve this so called uh, ecological crisis which we are into. Now, that could be one way of looking at because now in this indigenous knowledge again or traditional ecological knowledge is primarily based on uh, the trial and error experiences of human in their natural setting. Now, these experiences in a sense can be either improved or implemented, so that there can be a way out uh, in this uh, uh, present context, wherein the idea or this, uh, this sustainability is pretty much uh, talked about and debated or maybe sustainable development. Now, in the if you look at human ecology also tends to look at uh, the way human communities and human populations are not to be seen in isolation, but also they are part and parcel of the ecosystem. They are one the uh, interrelated parts of the earth. Now, it is the 
special ecology of this species which is called the homo sapiens. Now, uh, the humans are also part of this uh, whole ecosystem and which is to be known as uh, homo sapiens. Now, human ecology was uh, established uh, in, in the field of sociology or sociological field in the 1920s, although uh, this uh, very basic discipline was being used by mainly who practice uh, geography or in the field of geography. Uh, in, a, in a, I mean the, the geographers were the pioneer in terms of using this uh, concept. Now, in recent times, the human ecology development uh, is in a sense mostly focused towards the decision of environmental management, uh, making use of uh, the nature in a more rational manner. When we talk about rational, we are not simply uh, making sense of uh, the resources, but we tend to you know uh, weigh between the pros and cons and ultimately if it only benefits the humans, we tend to uh, engage in that. That is uh, more or less uh, a choice which is being made rationally and this in essence has uh, led to uh, a diverse understanding of uh, anthropological system. That is uh, anthropologists usually looked at the human culture and human society and uh, the way human society operates in the environment is something the ecological anthropologist tends to look at and which perhaps I uh, will be discussing more in detail in the upcoming lectures uh, <coughs> how the ecological anthropology operates. Now, secondly uh, human ecology also uh, uh, attempts to explore not only the influence of humans on uh, their immediate environment, but also it, it tends to look at the influence of the environment on human behavior. So, as I said the human culture is also being uh, to a certain extent being uh, influenced by the environment which uh, human are in. Now, uh, the food habits, the kind of dress or maybe the kind of socio-religious practices which human have is being in a sense uh, uh, effect, I mean influenced by the environment system. And through this, the human comes up with uh, an adaptive strategies or adaptive mechanisms in order to uh, manage or make sense or adjust with these influences in a much more better way. Now, uh, if you take an examples of uh, the riparian communities who are mostly inhabiting the bank of the river that is the riparian communities, uh, they are quite prone to you know like uh, encountering these floods. So, they might have a different uh, cultural or uh, adaptive mechanism to encounter these floods, uh, maybe in terms of their food habits or maybe in terms of their economic activities, agriculture practices and maybe for instance, the way they build their houses. Uh, there is a particular community in the Assam which is called the missing tribe they have these uh, houses called Changar and uh, they have uh, built a house which is elevated from the ground maybe 4 to 5 feet higher and which in essence 
uh, is used as uh, a coping strategy in terms of you know like staying uh, aloof from the water which is which is normally uh, during the flood. And also uh, they have in essence a different kind of uh, you know uh, a, a warning system which they tends to understand or perceive about the impending floods through the science of uh, uh, maybe the behavior of the animals and then the sounds of birds and animals. Now, these are something which a cultural community tends to develop uh, across uh, a time span and generations. Uh, and through this they are able to cope with any kind of disaster in a much more uh, better way. So, that uh, the kind of impact or uh, maybe the lost in terms of maybe human lives can uh, be lessened and if not be avoided. Now, if you look across different cultural communities they might have some kind of all these uh, adaptive strategies to encounter or understand their environment in a much more better way. Now, this perhaps in a way is a way of thinking about the uh, world or maybe let us say the cosmology of any community that is the world view how they perceive and how they try to situate and make sense and understand their relationship with the environment. Now, this perhaps is in a way how they tends to you know like perceive the world around them and a context in which they in a sense defined themselves. So, within this we have to you know define our questions and ways to answer those questions. Why perhaps this particular community behave this way and wh why is that they are following this kind of food habits or attires the dress code. So, it has to be uh, understood in the context we cannot afford to uh, read out of the context. It has to be read and understood or interpret in, the, uh, in that particular context. Why people behave so, why they perceive so, why they think so. Now, uh, I would like to recall uh, Weber's understanding of uh, Verstehend, uh, which uh, is a German term which he talks about uh, interpretative understanding in sociology, wherein human needs to make sense or understand uh, of other cultural groups by seeing into the subjectivity of the person who practice. Now, for instance, an accent to an outsider what I do, what I act, the way I behave might not really make sense a complete sense to someone who belong to a different cultural group. Now, within my own cultural group what I do, the way I speak, my uh, gesture, the way I make a facial expression, it makes sense to my immediate if not uh, within my cultural group is simply because you have that kind of shared understanding and the kind of societal values, norms, ethics are something which we have learned and uh, these are in a sense a learned behavior. Now, by saying so that subjective meaning which uh, that embedded meanings which is attached to that particular accent should be understood in that particular context. Now, if 
an outsider should or attempts to make sense of a particular things, he should tends to interpret things from the taking the position of that particular person or community which he or she is looking into or studying. Only then that intrinsic or that embedded meaning which is attributed to that action could be meaningfully interpreted. This is what Weber has uh, talked about in verse 10 that is interpretative understanding of uh, un interpretative understanding of human actions and the kind of meanings it attaches to it. Well, uh, moving on what human ecology attempts to look at, how does it tends to operationalize or uh, how it attempts to investigate uh, the sort of the environment. Now, on the right hand side is a picture which was taken by me uh, way back in the 2016 May. This is a place called uh, Juko Valley, which is on the border of Manipur and Nagaland state. Uh, and this valley is uh, a tourist destination and it, 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 it is uh, the panoramic view and the picture scheme of this valley is so fascinating to uh, the people around and then there is this uh, visitor which is you know like across different parts of the country and then even uh, we have come across foreigners visiting. And usually uh, this enchanted uh, valley uh, there is a lily which is called Juko lily which in a sense uh, blooms in the month of May to June. Now, the reason why I am uh, portraying this picture is apart from this uh, you know scenic beauty with the increase of tourists uh, developing into uh, moving into this area. Uh, in the last summer when I visited I have come across uh, you know like uh, unwanted uh, throwing of waste item by those uh, people like who are engaged in the cooking and then certain other sort of picnics and all. Now, it in a sense pose a threat to the biodiversity of that particular place. And also we have come across in the vicinity of this uh, area where there was uh, the forest was set, uh, set ablaze by fire and then you can actually I do not have a picture with me now. Uh, we have uh, come across the forest which was being set fire by uh, the region being unknown, but uh, with the kind of uh, precautionary measures taken by the revolution I mean the volunteers of that area. Uh, it, it, it was it was evident that might be because of the irresponsible you know like lighting uh, I mean the use of light uh, by the visitors maybe using of the match stick and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why I am highlighting this uh, issue is because these are some examples of how the humans leave a far reaching implications on the, the footprints which we have in a sense has a far reaching impact on the environment or the biodiversity. Now, maybe who knows like in the coming 5 years, 10 years this a whole area might be uh, you know like full of waste and then uh, not so you know like attractive like at it is now. So, there has to be an increasing awareness in terms of how we uh, you know like uh, 
<coughs> and gates uh, in the environment in a mo much more uh, responsible way because unless we are aware about uh, the kind of uh, you know footprint which we are causing on the environment uh, it is nowhere going to be a lasting uh, solution now this very idea i mean the i'm just trying to bring in this uh, sort of a, <coughs> a flow chart wherein you can see how things are being uh, interconnected and uh, within the environment how the human uh, and nature in a sense uh, shared sort of uh, a symbiotic if not and a very interconnected relationship. Now, uh, there can be in a natural setting or in the there can be a sort of a change through the anthropogenic conditions and this itself uh, the social or the humans are in a way being responsible and by engaging into this the human culture tends to uh, pose a threat not just to the natural uh, and eventually it has in a sense a repercussion to the uh, human. Now, if you look at the, uh, the different uh, sub disciplines of ecological sciences and of which human ecology is also one of them uh, and within the bioecological you have this human ecology, animal ecology and so and so forth and for you to have a rough idea of how uh, human ecology emerges out of these ecological sciences, uh, which is more or less theoretical and then it tries to, it endeavors to come up with certain kind of and uh, lasting sort of uh, an answer, because it begins with posing equations. Now, in real settings, human feels uh, the influence of different environmental factors and this perhaps are uh, some of the things which uh, we need to look at how these uh, components are interrelated within the environmental factors and uh, we will uh, continue discussing uh, of this in the next lecture.